So hello and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, this month's NeTech uh, mini school um, on energy materials. Um, so for those of you who are perhaps regular mini school attendees, you'll recognize that, hopefully recognize that I'm not Professor Francesco Protagioni. So he's the, the interim director of NeTech and he usually hosts um, these mini schools and NeTech related events. Um, so unfortunately he couldn't be here um, for today's session. So um, I'll be standing in um, on his behalf. And so for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm uh, Dr. Graham Pleasant. So I'm a postdoc researcher um, in the Quantum at Sun research group headed by Prof. Um, Francisco Protagioni here at Stellenbosch University. And so, yeah, as I said, um, uh, this month's mini school will be on energy materials. And I'm delighted to to um, to announce that um, today's lecture will be um, given by Prof. Jorges Alane, if I pronounce your name correctly. Um, and he will be giving us an interesting lecture on 2D materials and their heterostructures for photocatalytic water splitting and photovoltaics. Um, so perhaps I can hand over to Dr. Kingsley Abodo to give a more thorough uh, introduction to our speaker. Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've known Dr. Um, Professor Georges now for a while, which is, um, I think it's about eight years ago, you know, nine years. He is currently based at the Center for Materials Engineering at the Zababa Institute of Technology. He obtained his bachelor's degree in Araba Munich University in Ethiopia and went on to do his master's degree at Osbot University in Germany. Then he did his um, doctorate degree at Grenoble Institute of Technology in France. Um, also, he studied at Grenoble Institute of um, Technology in France, but um, then subsequently did an electron electrical engineering PhD at, in Finland between 2014 to 2018. He's worked in various capacity at different universities in Ethiopia. His core interest looks at um, research in the area of 2D materials and heterostructures for both photocatalytic water splitting, photovoltaic synthesis, characterization of nanomaterials, nanodevices. He is an expert in um, evaluation of various 2D systems using the functional theory. And also he looks at um, energy efficient systems for different applications. He's published several papers in international journals and um, as well as received grants for his research excellence. He's, um, at this point, he's involved in several teaching and mentoring and supervising graduate students at Addis Ababa University. Um, Professor Georges is also, has also, he's also the current head of the Department for Materials Engineering and um, he's involved significantly in academic citizenship. So without further ado, I would like um, Professor Georges to um, begin his presentation. Um, thank you very much, Georges, for giving this uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Kingsley, for the kind introduction. Uh, so I will go on. I will start the, the presentation. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so thank you very much uh, and welcome everyone. So my talk is on 2D materials and their heterostructure for photocatalytic water splitting and photovoltaics application. So this is the outline of my talk. Uh, so I will uh, briefly introduce uh, the, the field. And then uh, I will introduce 2D materials uh, used as a photocatalyst and photovoltaics application. Uh, after that, I will go to 2D heterostructure materials. And for this section, I will select three uh, relevant papers from the research work uh, in my institute with my group. And I will discuss the results. And finally, the conclusion.
So uh, as an introduction, photocatalytic water splitting is a simple process. So you break uh, a water molecule to hydrogen and oxygen using sunlight. It is actually similar to what naturally occurs in photosynthesis. Uh, then this hydrogen can be used as a clean and renewable energy carrier. Uh, the challenges of this photocatalytic water splitting is it has low efficiency, high cost, and material stability is an issue. Uh, regarding photovoltaics, uh, as you already know, it is a technology that converts light into electricity using semiconducting materials uh, by photovoltaic effect. Uh, a single photovoltaic device is known as a cell. And when we combine these cells, uh, we can get panels or modules. And if you further combine the modules, you will get an array. Uh, so that will be the solar system, which produce electricity using the sunlight for different applications, for example, for powering homes and so on. The advantage of this technology is there is no uh, pollution, uh, no greenhouse gas emission, and it can be scaled uh, largely. Uh, the challenge is, for example, to produce some amount of energy, you need to use some land use uh, to place the solar panels. And energy storage is uh, required because sunlight is intermittent, so you cannot get it the whole time as sunlight. So you have to store it and use it later. So because of this, we need usually a battery system to store the energy. Uh, uh, so for photocatalytic and uh, photoelectrocatalytic, uh, these are uh, the two promising techniques for solar to chemical energy conversion. Mm. Mm. So if you see here, uh, you can see uh, PEC. Uh, so you have photoelectrode, a semiconductor material, and in that material, uh, in that cell, photoelectrochemical cell, you can reduce water uh, on one of the electrode, and you can uh, oxidize water on the other electrode. And the, the system is like this one, you have external circuit and you, you have a counter electrode and you have a photoelectrical system. For case of photocatalytic, uh, it is a simple. You just uh, use uh, photocatalytic particles and you can disperse it inside a water uh, or you can put it in a substrate and you can get uh, overall water splitting. Uh, that means both uh, oxygen volition reaction and hydrogen volition reaction, or you can get separately hydrogen volition reaction or oxygen evolution reaction separately. I'm on my screen pretty soon. Uh, so in general, for efficient solar hydrogen production, we need to consider different things. The one of the thing is it should be low cost. So when we consider the cost, the material cost and the abundance of the material on Earth is important. And the device fabrication cost should be also uh, uh, small and the system cost in general should be uh, small. And also it should have high efficiency. Uh, for example, when we say high efficiency, the light absorption efficiency of the photocatalytic material should be uh, good. Otherwise the overall solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency will be low and the system might, might not be good. The other factor is you need to consider also stability. Uh, the system sh should be chemically stable in a quiet environment usually we are using it in a quiet environment and the electrical stability also should be good. So the principles of photocatalytic water splitting, we can see it in this uh, schematic. Uh, so this is the orange color, let's say it is uh, uh, the photocatalytic material. So the first step is uh, the photocatalyst uh, 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 excited to generate a, the light, we can illuminate it by light and we can create holes and electron. Then the hole and the electron moves to the surface of the photocatalytic material. And on the surface, we can have uh, 
uh, water reduction and water oxidation process. The overall efficiency for this, term, the, for the, this uh, uh, system, it has three components. One of the component is efficiency of light harvesting. How efficient is the material to harvest the light? The other one is efficiency of charge separation. And the last one is efficiency of surface catalytic reaction. So these three, uh, efficiency, uh, these three components contribute on overall efficiency of the system. So we can see them separately. Uh, before that, in overall water splitting, what is happening is, as I mentioned before, uh, reduction of water and oxidation of water reaction as shown in, in this reaction path. And here I put a schematic uh, to show that what is a good photocatalytic material. So for this semiconductor to be uh, a good uh, photocatalytic, it should at least straddle the chemical potential for uh, hydrogen redu uh, water reduction and water oxidation. So in this schematic, if you see, you have uh, the redox potential, uh, the dashed line shows the redox potential of water, and this black line shows the band edge of the semiconductor. So the above one is the conduction band, so it should be always high, higher than the redox potential of water. And the lower one is uh, the valence band uh, maximum, and it should be less than uh, or lower than the, the redox potential of water. If the system fulfills this condition, then we can say it is a good material for photocatalytic water splitting. So I mentioned before three parameters for the overall efficiency of the system. The first one is efficiency of light harvesting. So when we consider efficiency of light harvesting, if you see the spectrum of light on the right, most of the light spectrum lies in the visible range, like 47% of the light is visible range. So if our, uh, if we want our semiconductor or photocatalytic material to absorb more light from the sunlight, its band gap actually should be uh, in, between, in the visible range. So we have to use some techniques to change the, the light absorption property of the semiconductor. And this can be uh, done, uh, for example, in one way by doping. Uh, uh, by, uh, by some metallic or non-metallic elements in the material, we can tune the absorption properties of the material and we can get a good, we can improve the efficiency of light harvesting. The other component is efficiency of charge separation. For this one, uh, for example, if we make some junctions, let's say if you have uh, uh, a PN junction, so when you combine the pin junction, there will be a built-in electric field. And this electric field uh, assists us to separate the electron and hole. For example, the P, uh, the electrons move to the N type and the holes move to the P type. So this will assist the, the, the separation of the photo generated carriers. So if we make this type of junction, we can actually improve the efficiency of charge separation of the photocatalytic system. Uh, the last one is efficiency of surface catalytic reaction. For this one, we can use uh, a co-catalyst on the surface of the photocatalyst. Uh, so this uh, co-catalyst actually can help us to uh, reduce the energy barrier for the chemical reaction. For example, if you see in this schematic, the blue one is with a co-catalyst and the black one is without a co-catalyst. So uh, using a co-catalyst significantly reduce the energy barrier for the chemical reaction and it facilitates uh, and improves the efficiency of the, the system. So the, uh, then I will continue on 2D materials used as a photocatalyst and photovoltaics application. Uh, so just to start, 2D materials are atomically thin layer of materials that have uh, good electronic and optical properties. And one of the good thing is they, they have tunable band gaps. So you can uh, tune or modulate the band gaps and you can adjust it by different methods. And they have high surface area, uh, the 2D surface, and short charge transport paths. Because of this, they are a good candidate for photocatalytic and photovoltaics application. 
And in addition to the materials can be classified in two different categories. You have like uh, uh, based on their chemical composition uh, and structure. Uh, so we can have like carbons, like graphene. Uh, we can have uh, oxides, for example, zinc oxide. We can have polymers. We can have maxines. We can have chalcogenides. Uh, I read it because we, uh, I highlighted it because most of the examples we are going to use are chalcogenide based 2D materials. And we can have also metallic metal organic framework uh, uh, 2D materials. So 2D materials have uh, been attracting significant attention as a potential candidate uh, uh, for photocatalytic and photovoltaic application uh, because of their ability to absorb light and generate uh, charge carriers. This is a crystal structure of some sample 2D materials. You can see on a, a graphene, a single a monolayer of uh, graphene, a carbon, hexagonal carbon. Uh, on B, uh, you can see uh, phosphorin uh, and C, carbon nitride, D layered uh, double hydroxide. Uh, and on E, we can see hexagonal boron nitride. Uh, we can have uh, metal uh, charcogenides and maxine. So some examples of 2D material is one of them is transition metal dichalcogenide. When we say transition metal dichalcogenide, I will show uh, later how uh, uh, what their stoichiometry and chemical composition is. But typically we, we are referring like molybdenum disulfide, tungsten disulfide, tungsten diselenide, and so on. These are called transition metal dichalcogenide. Other uh, is phosphorine. Uh, uh, which is a single layer of black uh, phosphorus. Uh, this is also one example of 2D materials uh, for, uh, for photocatalytic application. Maxine is uh, an, uh, a relatively new 2D materials, and they are 2D transition metal carbides or nitrides. So when I go to 2D heterostructures uh, used as a photocatalyst and as a photovoltaics, uh, uh, we can uh, heterostru 2D heterostructure, I, I think it is uh, uh, known by uh, everyone, but it is like a stack or a junction of 2D materials. So uh, here in the schematic, it shows like a Lego. So if you have a, a monolayer uh, of one material and another type of monolayer, and if you stack them together, you can get a heterostructure material. And this uh, making this heterostructure material uh, modifies uh, the properties of the 2D material. And we will see some examples of 2D heterostructure materials investigated in our research group. Uh, so heterostructure of 2D materials can improve the photocatalysis and photocatalytic performance of by creating new or modified electronic states. And uh, I, I will show also uh, when we make these 2D heterostructures, it enhances or it facilitates the charge separation of photogenerated electron carriers, uh, photogenerated carriers. Uh, 2D heterostructure have several uh, advantages. Uh, one, they have large surface areas, uh, 2D heterostructure, uh, high surface areas that can enhance the absorption of water molecule and increase the reaction size. Uh, and they have tunable band gaps that can match the solar spectrum and improve the light uh, absorption efficiency. And we, we will see also they have type two band gap alignment and this type of band gap alignment is good for uh, separation of photogenerated electron and holes. And they have flexible band edge position that can straddle the water redox potential under different pH conditions. And when we see uh, these heterostructures, we might get like 0D, 0D, 1D, 1D, and 2D, 2D, and so on, different heterostructure. But the 2D, 2D heterostructure is preferred uh, compared to the other heterostructures. Uh, the reason is it has high surface area, uh, more surface active sites, uh, superior electron mobility, and uh, excellent photocatalyst, uh, photocatalyst support. Uh, these are some of the recent papers we have published in the area of 2D heterostructure for photocatalytic and photovoltaic application. And in my discussion, I will go on through some of the papers 
uh, in the next slides. So I'm, I said we can uh, define transition metal dichalcogenide. Uh, maybe it is obvious, but uh, it has MX2 uh, stoichiometry, where M is a transition metal and X is a chalcogen. So transition metal, uh, you can get it from the periodic table, uh, uh, the transition metals. And if you combine, combine it with a chalcogen, chalcogen is usually sulfur, selenium, and tellurium. So if you combine one transition metal with two uh, sulfur, for example, you will get MS2, then that is transition metal dichalcogenide. And usually they have a layered structure, uh, so they are 2D materials, uh, and it is easy to exfoliate them because uh, the, the, the planes are connected by a weak Van der Waals uh, interaction, so it is easy to exfoliate and to get 2D materials. And we will discuss also Janus transition metal dichalcogenide. It is actually similar to transition metal dichalcogenide, but instead of having the same chalcogen on the top layer on, and the bottom layer, you can change one of uh, the chalcogen by another uh, element. For example, in this example, we have molybdenum, and on the bottom, we have tellurium, and on the top, we have sulfur. So this is a Janus transition metal dichalcogenide. It is a new uh, type of uh, transition metal dichalcogenide, and I think only two types of uh, transition metal dichalcogenide are experimentally fabricated yet, but most of them are theoretical. Uh, in in the papers I am going to discuss, we have used different methods like VASP method and quantum spreso method to do the DFT calculation and also materials studio usually to prepare the heterostructures. So the first paper I'm going to discuss is Janus uh, tungsten sulfur selenium with zinc oxide heterostructure. Uh, what we have done in this uh, uh, heterostructure is we have uh, prepared eight high symmetry stacking or orientation of uh, WSSE with zinc oxide. Uh, after making eight high symmetry stacking patterns, we calculated the binding energy. Uh, to calculate the binding energy, what we have used is uh, a simple formula, the total energy of uh, the heterostructure, the complex system, minus the constituting two uh, monolayers, like here WSSE and zinc oxide. Then from this, we can get the binding energy. And after getting the binding energy for the different stacking patterns, we have selected the three of them, which has relatively low binding energy. That means they are more stable. So we selected these three uh, stacking patterns and we continue our study on these three uh, stacking patterns. So this is uh, how we make the heterostructure. For example, here we have WSSE on the bottom. And on the top, we have zinc oxide. So this is a side view. And B and C shows you a top view. Uh, so depending on the alignment of, for example, the zinc and the tungsten and so on, how it is shifted, the zinc and the, the, the tungsten, we can have different type of stacking patterns. And as I mentioned before, we have selected three of them out of the eight high symmetry stacking patterns and studied them. The first thing we have done is we calculated the, the phonon band structure uh, for the three systems. So if you see on C, uh, you can see that uh, it has imaginary optical modes on the negative. Uh, it has imaginary optical modes. And uh, this means the system is not dynamically stable. So if it is not dynamically stable, it is not more interesting to fabricate it. Uh, it is not easy to fabricate it and realize it experimentally. So we excluded this uh, heterostructure and our study continues on the two uh, heterostructures which are more, uh, which are dynamically stable. Then uh, we investigated the electronic uh, structure of the system. Uh, in the middle on B and C, 
you can see the two heterostructures, selected heterostructures, without applying any strain. Uh, and we also investigated when we apply tensile strain, as shown in C and F, 5% uh, tensile strain. And we also studied by applying a compressive strain, uh, like negative 5% and negative 5% for the two systems. Uh, so when we see the electronic structure, it is actually the band S, uh, conduction band, uh, the, the conduction band minimum and the balance band maximum is contributed by uh, the WSCSE. So the zinc oxide actually has no effect on, on the band H contributions, uh, but it is dominated by WSCSE. That's one thing we have uh, noticed. Uh, the other thing we have noticed is when we apply compressive strain, like in D, you can see that uh, the yellow part is contributed by the zinc oxide. So the valence band uh, maximum is contributed by the zinc oxide here. And uh, this, actually I will show later, this kind of when one of the band edge is contributed one by one material and the other band edge is contributed by the other material, then this type this type of material is called type two band gap alignment. So what we have seen is there is a possibility to change the type uh, the the system to type two alignment by applying uh, compressive strain. And as you can see, you have a direct band gap uh, semiconductor without strain. And it is almost, uh, again, direct band gap with tensile strain. Uh, but when we go to compressive strain, it is like indirect band gaps semiconductor. So what we have learned is that uh, from this investigation is by applying strain, it is possible to change the band gap nature of the material and also the band gap uh, alignment type. Uh, for the zinc oxide, uh, we have also studied uh, the effect of biaxial in-plane uh, compressive strain on uh, the dipole moment of the zinc oxide. Uh, here, uh, it says backlink. Backlink means the z-axis separation between the oxygen and the zinc. So, uh, so you can uh, draw a plane, and this separation is called the backlink. And this backlink uh, actually affected by uh, strain. When we apply compressive strain, uh, for example, when you apply negative five percent uh, compressive strain you can get like 0 0.12 angstrom backlink. So we are playing, uh, we are uh, significantly changing the backlink of the zinc oxide by strain. But when we apply tensile uh, strain, uh, it is not significant, as you can see. The backlink reduced, but it is not significant. And we have seen also the potential difference, the dipole moment, uh, how it is affected by strain. So when you see here uh, around 0.1 uh, backlink, uh, you can have like 0.8 electron volt uh, potential difference. So we have learned that uh, by applying the strain, we can actually significantly change the dipole moment of the zinc oxide. Uh, this is uh, the different stacking co configuration, the two stacking configuration, and the two constituting uh, materials, WSAC and zinc oxide. And we have also calculated the band gap values for this. And as you can see, actually, the band gap value uh, is determined by the WSAC, which is similar to the WSAC. As I mentioned before, uh, when we see the conduction band uh, maximum and uh, the, the conduction band minimum and valence band maximum, uh, I, I said that it is contributed by the WSCSE. So this, uh, on the band gap value, this zinc oxide has no significant uh, effect.
Then we are interested on photocatalytic applications. So we draw together uh, the redox potential of the water. This is the dash line together with the band age value of the materials. So we studied three cases. One is using only WSAC. The other one is the two heterostructures we have uh, selected before. So if you see here, uh, for example, uh, for WSAC, it has two sides. Uh, one uh, one uh, of the plane is terminated by sulfur and the other one is terminated by selenium. And when we compare them, uh, the yellow one is when it is terminated by S and the uh, like green is when it is terminated by SCE. So depending on on which surface you are studying the photocatalytic activity, it has difference. For example, when it is on the SCE side, it is good more or less for uh, hydrogen evolution reaction, but it is not good for oxygen evolution reaction. But when we see uh, the S side, it is good actually for oxygen volition reaction. And even uh, uh, at zero strain, it is um, good for overall water splitting. That means for both oxygen volition reaction and hydrogen volition reaction. And what we have noticed that uh, when we apply uh, tensile strain, uh, the conduction band minimum uh, is reduced it is energy value then for the heterostructure we have also tried to investigate the effect of this strain and uh, without strain uh, for photocatalytic activity uh, for wsse zinc oxide heterostructure we found out that at uh, zero uh, strain that means without any strain it is good for hydrogen volition reaction but not good for oxygen volition reaction uh, uh, when we see it on uh, the S side uh, for the heterostructure, uh, uh, we have noticed that it has more or less similar property with uh, the monolayer WSAC uh, property. Uh, and uh, again, we have seen also WSES. This means S terminated uh, heterostructure. Uh, 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 and we investigated on the S side and on uh, SE side. And we have uh, uh, studied the effects on the photocatalytic activity. Uh, I think the trend is more or less uh, similar uh, for both. Uh, heterostructures and they have uh, uh, some applicability for photo overall water splitting but if we consider one of the case like, that means hydrogen volition reaction or oxygen volition reaction they are actually good uh, depending on the different conditions we have also investigated the effect of uh, uniaxial strain so uh, by putting uh, by reducing the interlayer spacing between the monolayers for the heterostructure and by stretching it that means by increasing the interlayer spacing we have tried to investigate the effect uh, for photocatalytic activity so we plotted the band edge together with the uh, redox potential of water and we have uh, investigated different effects. Uh, for example, here, uh, it is uh, the conduction band, the, the conduction band minimum is decreasing in energy when we apply tensile uh, uniaxial strain and so on. And one interesting thing we have seen is, uh, the, I mean, this material uh, is good, this heterostructure is good uh, for overall water splitting uh, when we see it on the S side uh, of the, the heterostructure. Yeah, so we investigated this type of properties. Uh, I mentioned already about the effect of uh, strain on the potential difference. And we plotted the effect of the strain on the potential difference of the different isolated monolayers and the heterostructures. 
And one interesting thing we have noticed is here, when you see WSCSE, it is almost flat. The black one, it is almost flat. So strain has no any significant effect on the potential difference of the WSCSE. But if you see the green one, the zinc oxide, it is significantly changed when we apply uh, a compressive strain. So this uh, shows us, uh, and again, when you consider the heterostructures, the two heterostructures, the red one and the blue one, it is significantly changing. So what we have learned is uh, the dipole moment is controlled by the zinc oxide. Uh, when I discussed before, I said the zinc oxide has no significant effect on the band edge and the band gap value, that means the electronic property. But when we consider the dipole moment, it is actually uh, man manipulated by the zinc oxide. So this zinc oxide has this contribution on this uh, system, on the heterostructure. Uh, in addition to photocatalytic activity, we have also investigated uh, the photovoltaic, uh, uh, for, I mean, the power conversion efficiency for photovoltaic application. And we have calculated the power conversion efficiency at zero strain, it is around 12%. But when we apply tensile strain, as you can see, when you increase to 5%, the power conversion efficiency is significantly uh, enhanced. So we thought that by applying strain engineering, it is possible to, to play with the efficiency uh, or to enhance the power conversion efficiency of the, the heterostructures. And it has the same trend for the two heterostructures, different heterostructures. And we use this formula to calculate the power conversion efficiency. For the field factor, we have taken it from a literature. We have found that uh, for, uh, I, uh, for uh, one transition metal dichalcogenide to D material, the field factor is 0 0.57. And that is the only experimental study which is reported in literature according to our uh, as, uh, our investigation. So we use that because uh, our material is like transition metal dichalcogenide, So it has similarity. So based on that uh, empirical value and then the formula, we have calculated these PCE values. Uh, so I can add uh, two more uh, investigations on this transition metal uh, chalcogenide uh, heterostructure uh, and Janus transition metal dichalcogenide heterostructure uh, for photocatalytic and photovoltaic application. The second one is uh, we use Janus TMD with molybdenum disulfide. Uh, for this one, uh, what we have done is we use molybdenum disulfide as one layer and we combine it with uh, five different Janus transition metal dichalcogenide as you saw here. So the first step we have done is when we make the heterostructure, we need to calculate the lattice mismatch. The study shows that uh, when you have a lattice mismatch uh, of less than 5%, it is actually possible to realize it experimentally. So what we have done is we have calculated the lattice mismatch. And as you have, uh, as you can see, three of them has a lattice mismatch, which is five or less than 5%. So we selected this one. For the other one, we exclude them from our study because it is not possible to realize them experimentally according to literature. Uh, and then uh, we follow the same procedure. We make eight high symmetry stacking patterns using molybdenum disulfide and the Janus materials. So we have three Janus materials. So in total, we have made 24 uh, uh, stacking patterns. And from each uh, eight stacking patterns, we have selected only one, which is the most stable according to the binding energy. Uh, that means uh, the one which has a negative large number for the binding energy because it is most stable. So we selected this one AA2SE, AA2TE, and AA2SE for uh, the different uh, Janus and MOS2 uh, combinations. 
And then what we have done is we investigated the electronic properties uh, like using PB and HSE calculations. We calculated the band gap value, uh, the work function, uh, and the band edge values, valence band and con conduction band edge values as shown in this table uh, for the isolated monolayers. And then we make uh, the three heterostructures, the three selected heterostructures, and again calculated the different electronic properties uh, like HSC and PB band gap value and band age value and work function, and also the lattice parameters. And we uh, for the, the isolated one, uh, which has experimental counter, uh, which are already fabricated experimentally, we compare the results with the experiment. And if it is only investigated theoretically, we compare with previous theoretically investigated values. And uh, our result shows it is uh, our values are reasonable, and we can continue the study for these materials for the intended applications. And the other thing we have done is we tested uh, these uh, uh, systems. Uh, uh, one thing I have to mention here: when we calculate the HAC band uh, uh, band gap value for A to T A MOST, it is zero. This means it is a metallic system. If it is metal, then it is not uh, obviously good for photocatalytic uh, water splitting application. So what we have done is we excluded the, this material from further investigation in our study. So we investigated the two materials for photocatalytic applications, the AA2SE, MOSSE, and AA2SE, WSSE. And we plot the band edge values together with the uh, redox potential of water. And what we have found is, for example, uh, this uh, the valence band maximum edge is uh, the redox potential of water. Uh, for So this means it is good for oxygen evolution reaction. But when we see the other one, it is actually not good for hydrogen evolution reaction. And we believe that this is almost good for oxygen evolution reaction, but not good for hydrogen evolution reaction. And the other thing is we plot together uh, for the two uh, monolayers, that means the uh, MOSSE and uh, MOS2, for example, and we put it together. And when you put it, the band edge together in a plot, and when you get this staggered gap, then it is called type two band gap alignment. And this type two band gap alignment is actually very good for photocatalytic activity because uh, it is more efficient to separate the photogenerated uh, carriers. The electrons will reside on one material and the holes will reside on the other material. So it is uh, easy. Uh, I mean, we can significantly reduce the recombination rate and it is good for photocatalytic application. So this is interesting because we found type two alignment for both of them. And again, using the same formula as I showed you before, uh, we calculated the power conversion efficiency uh, for the two heterostructures. And for AA2, SCE, WSSE, we got around seven up to 12% uh, power conversion efficiency. And for the other, uh, uh, I, I know, for AA2, SCE, MOSSE, it is from seven to 12. And for AA2, SCE, WSSE, it is five up to 9% respectively. Uh, the last one, paper I want to uh, to discuss here is Janus transition metal dichalcogenide uh, with WSE2 heterostructure. Uh, it has more or less similar procedure with the previous paper. So we have initially considered six Janus materials as shown here uh, to make the heterostructure. And the next thing we have done is to test the lattice mismatch. And according to the lattice uh, mismatch value, we have selected three of them, which has a lattice mismatch, which is less than uh, 5%. The other three, they have a lattice mismatch of greater than 5%. Five, then we exclude them from the investigation. And again, we make 
eight high symmetry stacking patterns and for three combination uh, for three heterostructures so we have in total 24 heterostructures and then we uh, plot uh, the band edge values of the two constituting uh, monolayers of the heterostructure together and as you can see uh, actually we have got uh, again a staggered gap uh, which is type two band gap alignment, which is, uh, as I mentioned, because of the reasons I mentioned before, it is good for efficient uh, uh, separation of photogenerated electron carriers. And again, we investigated this material for photocatalytic application by plotting the band age values together with the redox potential water. Uh, we go actually one step further in this investigation. In the previous investigation, our investigation was only for pH zero value, but here we uh, assume for different uh, conditions, the uh, photocatalytic material workers. So we consider for pH seven and pH 14 also. And one interesting thing is for this uh, WSCET, WSCE2 system, uh, when you see the, uh, the pH at seven, uh, the band edges are lower than the redox potential and higher than the redox potential of water. And this is actually very good for, what, uh, for water splitting. And this system actually at pH seven, it is, suitable for overall water splitting. It can do both oxygen volition reaction and hydrogen volition reaction. And again, for uh, different uh, pH values for the different materials, we investigated and summarized the results. And uh, again, finally, we have calculated the PCE value, uh, power conversion efficiency value for the heterostructure. Uh, and we got like 20, 19, and 18%, which is uh, good relative to other published uh, results in the area. And we believe uh, it is a good material. These heterostructure materials are a good material for photovoltaic uh, application. So as a conclusion, uh, we have used first principle uh, DFT-based model. Uh, to calculate the electronic properties of different Van der Waals heterostructure. And we tested this heterostructure for solar cell and photocatalytic water splitting application. Uh, uh, our results shows that not all of this hetero, uh, heterostructure uh, can actually satisfy the bandage age requirements for, full, for overall water splitting, but they can be uh, used separately for oxygen evolution reaction and hydrogen evolution reaction. Uh, the other thing we found out is uh, the dipole moment of the zinc oxide monolayer is highly sensitive to strain. Uh, as I showed when we apply compressive strain, it is significantly affected. And this leads to broad tunability of heterostructure. So we can uh, actually tune the properties of heterostructures using uh, the strain uh, over a range of experimentally re uh, relevant strain values. So the use of strain tunable 2D materials to control band offset and alignment is general strategy. Uh, which can be applied to other Van der Waals heterostructure. Uh, and this might be advantageous in the context of clean energy applications, uh, including as we show, as I showed in photocatalytic application and other uh, uh, energy applications. As a remark, uh, even though there have been uh, advancements in the overall efficiency of water splitting uh, recently, uh, but the solar to hydrogen efficiency is still uh, quite low and will well be low expectation. Uh, and th th this is not good for commercial demonstration and applications. So we believe that this area is active for its research and uh, development. Uh, thank you very much. I think I am a little faster than I expected. Uh, yeah, this is my talk. Thank you. Um, thank you, Church, very much for the presentation. So
So we can start the Q&A sec section. Um, we have some questions in, um, George, we have some questions in the forum from Mohammed and um, from the Q&A. So maybe I can, I can start. Um, he, the first one was on slide 30. Uh, you can go to slide 30, yes. Okay. Uh huh. So his question is, what does the S and the SE site mean in the case of strain? In the case of strain? Yeah, I think um, uh, S so, and SE site, yeah. You know, when we have the Janus transition metal dichalcogenide, I think I can show with another schematic here first. Yeah, here, for example, you have molybdenum in the center plane and tellurium and sulfur. So you have two different, one is uh, sulfur side and the other one is like tellurium side. So the same is true for this uh, heterostructure for WSSCE. It has both sulfur side and SCE side. So if you investigate the sulfur side for photocatalytic activity, that means the surface on which the photocatalytic uh, uh, the reaction happens, then we say it S side. If it happens on SCE side, we say it SCE side. That is the difference. Okay. Um, he has another question. So the it's on slide um, 32. 32? Yes. Okay. So the question is um why. Why do strain have no um, dif um why there's no difference when you apply strain for the WSSE2? For the WSSSE, uh, what mm, um, do you have any explanation for that? Uh, okay, uh, I think uh, for the zinc oxide, because of the buckling, as we have investigated when we apply strain, this buckling uh, significantly uh, uh, affected by the strain. And the zinc and oxygen, they have different charge and this creates some dipole moment. We actually expected the same because S and SE, they have a charge difference and there is some intrinsic dipole moment and it might be affected by strain. But when we investigate uh, the effect, we have got uh, this value and our study shows that uh, it is not significantly affected by strain when you apply strain on WSSC. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what we okay. have. Got. Um, then his last question, he asked a couple of questions. Okay. Um, um, what influenced your choice of um, tungsten um, dichalcogenide and um, the zinc oxide? Yeah, what um what are the choice of choosing the heterostructure? So why do, what what influenced the, how you chose your heterostructure? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, so we, uh, I one of the when we in, initiate the research project, we are interested on Janus transition metal dichalcogenide. These these are a new class of materials. Uh, only two type of Janus transition metal dichalcogenide is yet experimentally fabricated. So to assist the experimentalists and to give some direction, we are interested on Janus WSSE uh, transition metal dichalcogenide. And why zinc oxide? When we combine it, uh, we are uh, when we combine it. Uh, with zinc oxide, the lattice mismatch is actually uh, less than five percent. So we can. Uh, that means this material can be experimentally fabricated. So that is uh, the reason. So we start from Janus and then go to zinc oxide because of lattice mismatch. And yeah. Um, there is another question from. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing this correct. Tanya Sabu, and the question is. Um, they were wondering if it would be a good idea to use pure transition metals for photocatalytic effect and water splitting, because transition metals have half filled D orbitals, which which might help in the photocatalytic effect. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but the other thing is uh, when we have Janus transition metal dichalcogenide. 
because of these two type of uh, chalcogen materials on the two different uh, uh, layers, this breaks the symmetry. They have charge difference. And there is some intrinsic dipole moment, which might assist for the charge separation of the photogenerated uh, photo carriers. So th that was our in intention, but I agree with you. It is also good to, to consider only the transition metal dichalcogenide, uh, and it depends on the interest of the researcher. All right. Um, are there any other questions before I take um, the, um, the other question from Mohammed? Does anyone have any specific question? I see that Jean Baptiste has raised his hand. I'm not sure if he wants to ask oh. a question. Oh, okay. Let me just. You should be allowed to talk. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Um, okay. Thank you, Georges, for your nice presentation. Uh, it was very. Interesting and uh, helpful. Also, uh, this is the same. Uh, I want to do the same. Uh, the same study in uh, photocatalytic and uh, hydrogen uh, evolution reaction and also the oxygen evolution reaction. So I saw that you use uh, quantum espresso and uh, and VASP. So my question is that uh, can you only use uh, maybe a quantum espresso to do uh, your the hydrogen evolution reaction, or you also need the VASP? Uh, okay, yeah. So I, uh, it is actually possible to do it uh, uh, only on quantum spreeso, but uh, when we do it in VASP, it is uh, much easier and efficient to get the band edge values. Uh, so we are using this band edge values to plot it together with the redox potential of water. And that was a straightforward. And uh, one of my collaborator was using VASP. And these are some of the reasons we combine VASP and quantum spree. So. Oh, okay. Um, I think that uh, in the future, I'll contact you so we can uh, you can help me with a few things with uh, your collaboration. Thanks. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, George, there is another question. It's um, what are the major advantages of these two D materials over um, titanium dioxide for water splitting reaction? Uh, uh, okay. I, I, one, one of the main uh, advantages, they have a high surface area, uh, these 2D materials. So you can uh, have more area for reaction. So th th they are good for, for the reaction, for, for oxygen evolution reaction or hydrogen evolution reaction. Uh, the other thing is, for example, uh, depending on the, la the layer, the number of layers of these 2D materials, you can have different uh, electronic property. For example, for mono layers, usually they are direct band gap semiconductor. And when you have two layers and three layers, it becomes indirect band gap. So there is a possibility to tune the electrical properties based on the number of layers. Uh, so this surface area and tunability of electronic property are um, the advantages for photocatalytic activity. Um, all right, thank you very much. Um, George, I just have a question. Uh, yeah. uh, my question is, why did you even consider the electrostatic potential difference as a function of strain when you are for these particular heterostructures, what is the underlying physics you are trying to get? Uh, actually, uh, when we apply the strain, the idea was to optimize the system for overall water splitting. Uh, as we have seen in the results, the, they are sometimes good for oxygen volition reaction and sometimes for hydrogen volition reaction, but not good for both of them. So the idea was to optimize the system uh, for photo uh, uh, for photocatalytic water, overall water photocatalytic uh, overall water splitting purpose, but then when we uh, see the 
we couldn't find the effect of zinc oxide on the material, uh, on the heterostructure, because the band aids are dominated by WSSE and zinc oxide was not playing any role. But when we apply this strain, we have seen some effects on the dipole moments of the zinc oxide, and we investigated further the, the effect of, on the zinc oxide dipole moments. And actually, we learned that uh, if you have a heterostructure, and if one of it is a, if one of the layer has a dipole moment, you can actually uh, modulate the dipole moment of one of the layer and control the heterostructure property. So this is actually a good way to tune uh, the the properties of the heterostructure without doing any physical contact or something. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Um, please, are there any other questions? Okay, um, maybe we should go back to Mohammed's question. He was asking what, um, I think this is still on slide 30. The question is, what did applied strain mean on S and SE side? So maybe, uh, Mohammed, can you just um, mm -hmm. um, uh, ask the question so that um, maybe I'm not asking the right question you were I, trying to find an answer I, for? I think, okay, I think he raised his hand. All right. You can unmute your mic, Mohammed. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor, for a nice talk. Uh, actually, my uh, my concern is uh, applied strain, as uh, as I can see, here on S site as it written and S C site. Uh, what 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 does it it actually mean? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So it means uh, not applying specifically on S side. Uh, we take uh, the mono layer, and we, for example, when you reduce the lattice parameter of one of the mono layer, you are applying strain on the system. Then when we investigate the photocatalytic activity, we are seeing on on which surface. So it is not on the surface we are applying, we are applying the strain on the monolayer, on the total monolayer, but we are investigating the properties on the, the, the S and SE side. And this has effect when we calculate the band age values. If you, when we calculate the band age values, uh, we, if you consider S side or SE side, it has different band age values. That is the effect. So yeah, the strain is applied uh, on the monolayer. And then when we cal uh, calculate the band age values, we are considering different surface. Okay, so it means uh, the strain is applied on, like uh, uh, you had two uh, layer or two uh, two two mono layers. Yes. So S site means you applied strain on one layer and something like that, or I may understand uh, something wrong. So when you have uh, the mono layer, for example, WSSE. It has it is low uh, it it is own lattice parameter yeah it has a value lattice parameter in the yes. hexagonal so yes. for this lattice parameter uh, for example if it was like uh, I mean let's say it is five then if we reduce it four so and when we make the heterostructure we applying uh, some strain on the system when one of it is compressed, then it affects the other, then the total system is compressed. When we uh, stretch it, then it is tensile strain. So we are applying actually the strain on the monolayer. It yeah, does not uh, depend yes. on, each, on which surface it is. Then the yes, surface okay. effect comes when we calculate the band edge value, if we consider yeah. SE or S. Okay, thank you. Uh, one uh, last question, if you allow me to ask. Yes, please. Uh, uh, and uh, I think that last one slide, uh, you showed some pH calculation. Which code uh, you used for these calculations? pH 0, uh, pH 7, uh, and pH 14. Yeah, this uh, one. Uh, it is actually, uh, you have an Ernest equation. Uh, 
so there is a, a simple formula. Uh, so we, uh, when you apply the, when you consider the pH value like 0, 7, 14, using yes. the formula, uh, I don't have it the formula here, but so you only put like the pH value. For example, if you put 14 in the formula, then it okay. will give you uh, the, uh, the, the redox potential value for that pH value. It is called non okay. equation. So it is, is an equation. Uh, is you can formula? find it in one of my paper, actually, in this paper, okay. in the third paper. I already show the formula and how we have done it. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. You are welcome. Um, I believe there are no more questions. So, um, George, I would um, hand over to to Dr. Good. Oh, okay. Is there, Mohammed, are you raising your hand again now? All right. I'll hand it over no. now to, to Dr. Grammy to continue and then maybe end the session today. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so if there's, if there's no further questions, then maybe I can just end by thanking the speaker again for a, for a wonderful talk. And um, yeah, hopefully see you all next week for the, the next lecture in the, in the mini school. Okay, thank you very much, everyone.